when, uh, when I began, or we began, uh, to have the conference here at, uh, at Calvary, I, I never um, preached the first couple years. And I had a lot of people come to me and say, why are you doing this? What's the passion behind this? What's the vision behind this? And so last year, I preached, and there was such a warm reception of, at that, I figured, well, I might as well try again. And so, uh, you know, I, I, after hearing uh, Pastor Mick and, and Pastor Karoma and their messages, I'm, it's kind of intimidating to even stand here this morning. Uh, but I, I preach in the pulpit where people like Earl Wilson and Harry Wood and Kevin Federoff have preached in the past anyway, so I, I'm used to being intimidated by the, by the atmosphere. But um, uh, we're, I, I just want to share with you a little bit of the heart of what is behind this. And um, a couple of years ago, it was, the, it was the very first year, Jerry Breckheisen was still working at headquarters, and, and uh, he called to interview me about this, and he said, what, what's the purpose for this? And, and I, I hadn't thought it all the way through. I knew it in my heart, but I hadn't verbalized it. And in that moment, God gave me these words. I said, who knows, but that God is preparing to send a 21st century holiness revival. And if he is, we want to be found fanning the flame. And that became a theme, and that, that, that has become really my passion over the last several years. And so last spring, I, okay, um, last spring, I, I, I've got to stop and tell you this. I, I asked Pastor Brad if he could put a clock in the back for me, and I wanted to make sure it wasn't on the front. So <laughs> I was going to say, I, I don't want that ticking down up here. <laughs> but last spring, I... <laughs> yeah. Can, can, can you read the word at the bottom there? <laughs> yeah, okay. I just wasted another one of my minutes. <laughs> but last spring, I was, uh, I was doing a sermon series, and one of the messages, I, I talked about a spiritual awakening, and I said there's five aspects of all spiritual awakenings. There may be many more than that, but I named five, and and uh, then I, I asked for volunteers to help me to research that because that was a statement I made, but I didn't really uh, research it. And I, I didn't have the documentation behind it, but I've been around the church long enough to, to believe that that was true. And so uh, I asked for some volunteers. Uh, is Rich Young in here and Roger Ream? Nope, they both heard this message enough. They've left the room. <laughs> But uh, anyway, uh, Rich Young and Roger Ream and Roger's son, Jason, who is a history major graduate, uh, summa cum laude or whatever, some kind of laude that, uh, from Houghton. Uh, he's got a, a master's degree, top of his class. And uh, they uh, began to research. And about June, uh, Roger talks to me and he says, Pastor, you, uh, we're finding all kinds of information on the five that you gave, but there's another one that keeps coming up. And uh, I said, what's that? He said, missional holiness. I said, well, I've got to add that in there. And so uh, because of that, I, I added a, a sixth sermon to, to the sermon series, and that means a sixth point to the message this morning because I'm summarizing uh, what I preached from September uh, through uh, the, the Sunday before last. And... Um, that, that was six sermons. I was sharing this at the dinner table uh, on Sunday with uh, Rick and Clara West and, and George Beals. And when I said six sermons, George fell asleep immediately uh, right there at the table. He said, how are we going to stay awake for uh, six sermons on, in one session? But I, I trust that the, the Lord will help me to be able to uh, put this together and, and, and to leave aside. I mean, they sent me so much information You would think if you had a lot of information, it'd be easier to preach, but it's actually more difficult because then you have to decide what you're going to use and what you're not going to use because it's all good. And so I I, I put a lot of work into that. And then to take six sermons and try to make them into one, there's a whole lot of other things that had to be cut. So I trust the Lord will help me to be able to communicate in a way that is a blessing to you. Uh, You were given a note-taking guide when you come in. I, I really don't care if you take notes. Some people like to take notes. Some people don't like to take notes. Some people, if they miss a blank, will stop me while I'm preaching almost and say, hey, you missed one. So that doesn't... But I, I hope everyone has one of these because on the, um, 
On the outside cover here, there's two prayers that uh, are going to be important for us at the end of the service. If you'd like to take notes, do it. If you don't, don't worry about it. But please have the note guide, and I'll give you some instructions at the end of the message uh, in regard to that. Also, I'm not going to start, as others have this... uh, during this conference with a uh, standing and, and reading scripture. Uh, the message is full of scripture, and uh, there is not a specific text that I'm going to use, and I'm not going to read all the scriptures, but the, but the um, scripture references are there. I think I'm speaking today to probably the cream of the crop of mature Christians, and so you can look them up, and you can read them later and, and verify uh, the, the accuracy of, of them actually being in Scripture. Uh, but our message this morning is spiritual awakening. Lord, set your church on fire. And uh, what messages, a uh, heart ablaze from, from Mick and, and, and Pastor uh, Joseph and, and, and the responding to, to the call for fulfilling the Great Commission. Uh, just recently, this summer, with some of the things that have been happening, Alvin Reed and Malcolm McDowell uh, wrote that some of the greatest movements of God came in dark spiritual times, and our day is filled filled with much darkness. Our culture has been described as post-Christian or even anti-Christian. Tolerance is promoted as a virtue while conviction is disdained as a vice, but we have hope. And this is where history becomes our friend. Out of the spiritual darkness of the Middle Ages, God brought a reformation. And when the Enlightenment began spreading rationalism and secularism across the West, God sent a succession of mighty awakenings. In our day, when the skies seem dark, we can see light on the horizon. Many have concluded that the only hope for America is revival. Pause for a moment and ponder, what if the current events propel us to pray and to seek the mercy drops before the shower, the sparks to a yet greater flame? Could it be that examples such as these above are an indication of the beginning of a mighty movement of God for which so many have prayed is a great revival at hand? Before I continue in the message, I want to just give a little bit of a definition of what I'm talking about, and and the terms revival and spiritual awakening are used uh, interchangeably, and perhaps even in my message I will do that, but in your thinking, I I want us to to clarify those terms. A revival is something that begins in the heart of an individual. We can have a personal revival. A revival is something also that happens in the church. When, when the church has, has become dead and dull, uh, we need a, a, a revival. We need, we need a fresh movement of God in our, in our midst as a church. Now, I'm not talking about a, a campaign of services or even a missional holiness conference. I'm talking about a movement of God, a fresh movement of God among us. That's revival. A spiritual awakening is when the revival moves outside of the church, when, when that movement of God affects the community, when it, when it affects a region, when it affects a nation, when it goes international and, and multiple nations are reached. That's a spiritual awakening. And so that's the, the, the distinction I'm using in those terms. It's all a movement of God, but for too many times we've had revival in the church, but it has not had any impact beyond the walls of the church. And we not only need revival today, and perhaps by next year we'll change the terminology, and rather than uh, a 21st century holiness revival, I may change that to 21st century spiritual awakening because that's what we need. The, the church has to have a revival first, but it needs, to be, it needs to move beyond the walls of the church. It needs to have a, a, an impact in, in our culture and, and across our land and around the world. And so there are six various uh, characteristics that, that we're going to look at. And as I said, this, this is not an all-inclusive list, but these are some of the things that you can always find in revival. The first thing that we want to notice is passionate prayer. Passionate prayer. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, it's just two chapters after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and they were moved out into into the streets uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, already 
the apostles, after they get out of prison, come together with the, with the Christians that are there, those who are following Christ, and, and they say, we need, we need prayer. We need a fresh movement of God. Now, I don't know how long that was be, between chapter 2 and chapter 4, but it couldn't have been very long. It was only a short period of time, but life happens. And, and, and those apostles had, had, had seen a healing take place in the temple, and the people got excited. And when the people got excited, the, the Jewish leaders got upset, and the, the apostles uh, that, that were there were thrown into prison, and they were threatened, and they were beaten, and they were told, don't ever preach again, don't ever teach again in the name of Jesus Christ. And they said, well, who should we listen to? Should we listen to you or should we listen to God? And so in order to have the, the boldness to proclaim the word of God as they felt they should, they, they came back. These men who had been in the upper room, these men who were there on the day of Pentecost came back and said, God, we need a fresh touch. We need a fresh move. And today, we, we need to realize that the church of Jesus Christ needs a great move of the Holy Spirit in our world. Prayer meetings were the, for, were the forerunners of the 19th century holiness revival that gave birth to the holiness denominations, including the forerunners of the Wesleyan church. In 1835, Sarah Lankford and Phoebe Palmer combined the women's prayer meetings of two churches to form the Tuesday meetings for the promotion of holiness. Before long, men wanted to come, and so they opened it up to everyone, and, and even the clergy began to come to the prayer meeting. And, and out of the, this prayer movement, a, a great revival came that had a tremendous impact on who we are as uh, the Wesleyan church and the holiness movement. The Welsh revival uh, in uh, 1904, was sparked on a day of prayer and fasting. And because of minimal response to the gospel, they called for a day of prayer and fasting. Now, there had been a lot of prayer for, for more than a year that had gone on before this. But on this day of prayer and fasting, suddenly things changed dramatically, and thousands were converted during the next 12 months. When, when there is a spiritual awakening that, that moves out, we're not satisfied to just do church as normal, status quo. There will be a, a great movement of, of people coming to Christ, and we'll talk more about that later. But, but in the absence of that in our culture, we see the need for revival. Prayer was a key element of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association in the latter part of the 20th century. Matter of fact, Billy Graham said there's three elements to crusade preparation. Pray, pray, pray. Okay, so prayers, that's, that's the starting point. We have to recognize the need. Hey, God, we've done this on our own long enough. We need a fresh movement of God in the church. Amen? We need a fresh movement of God, and we, we call out to God in prayer. Well, the second thing that we notice then is as we pray, as we see the need, as we look to God, he answers us by calling a, a spiritual leader or a group of spiritual leaders. You know, as we look back and, and, and in the research, a number of things that we're going to be talking about, we're going to talk about men and women, people. We've already mentioned Phoebe Palmer and her sister, Sarah Langford, and, and we'll be talking about Wesley and, and Whitfield and Finney, and there's a name there. There's always somebody who's the point person. God, in response to our prayers, God raises up a spiritual leader or a group of spiritual leaders to, to bring this revival, this spiritual awakening into to being. And, and we want to glance quickly at the first two chapters of Nehemiah. Again, I'm not going to read them. The, re the references are in your uh, note-taking guide, but I want to just share with you. The, the, the characteristics of spiritual leadership that, that will be in the people that God calls to lead a spiritual awakening. The first one is a compassionate leader. In, in Nehemiah 1.4, when Nehemiah realized the condition of the city of Jerusalem and that the gates had been destroyed and, and the temple had been destroyed and all the things that had happened there, he wept. He, he was moved with compassion. The, 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 the people or persons that God raises up will be compassionate leader. The, the second thing that we want to notice, that they will be a praying leader. Before Nehemiah talked to the king about the problem, he talked to the king of kings about the problem. 
He talked to God about the problem. He went to God in prayer before he ever revealed the need to the king. And the third thing that we notice is that uh, he, this, these individuals will be influential leaders. Nehemiah was the cupbearer to the king. And the cupbearer and the king had a good, close relationship. It had to be somebody uh, that the king really trusted. Because not only did the, the, the cupbearer bring the cup to the king, he brought the food to the king. And he had to taste the food to make sure that it was okay for, for a couple reasons. One was the cupbearer became so close to the king, he knew what the king liked. And so if it wasn't something that the king was going to like, he didn't take it to the king. He also tasted it in case somebody had put poison in it. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty, pretty strong uh, position to be in. And, and, and so he, he'll be an influential leader. He had access to the king. He, he was, he, his job was to go into the presence of the king, okay, and, and to cheer up the king. And so uh, he, he, the, the leaders of a spiritual awakening will be, courageous, uh, will be influential leaders. The, the fourth one is courageous leaders. Uh, they, they, they will be strong and courageous. Nehemiah in, uh, in Nehemiah 2, verses 2 and 3, acknowledges his fear, but he took action anyway, d- despite his fear. Being courageous doesn't mean you don't have fear. Being courageous means you do what's right in spite of your fear, okay? And so he, did, he acknowledged his fear, but he did what was right. A uh, leader used by God for revival and spiritual awakening will need to be a person of unusual courage. Uh, the, over Labor Day weekend, we spent some time in North Carolina with the, our son and his family, and then we went on down to Myrtle Beach for a few days. And while I was at Myrtle Beach, I really suffered for Jesus. I was sitting out under an umbrella and uh, re- reading uh, the, uh, the biography of Wesley. And when I got tired of doing up that we moved up and found a shady spot next to the pool and read. And so that was, that was our vacation. And, and I, I read a story about Wesley when he was in a, a home one, one day, and this is after he had, you know, he had gone out and reached a lot of people, and he, he went out to the, to the people that were really, really uh, uh, difficult to reach, some of the people that were really uh, calloused and, and evil, and, and he went out to them, and uh, a mob showed up at this house where Wesley was, and uh, the woman of the house said, you need to hide in the closet. He said, I think I better stay right where I am. And about that time, the, the hinges broke off the door, and the door fell in, and here's this big mob, and Wesley stepped right out into the middle of them, and in his loud preacher voice, I mean, he, he could preach without microphones that thousands of people could hear him, and he began to point around, he said, what have I done to you, and what have I done to you, and what have I done to you, and all of a sudden, they got real quiet, and so he broke out into a sermon, and they listened to him the whole time. Then when it was all over, he went back inside, he said, man, you know, the mercy of God, has been with me. I doubt if he said man. That's probably more of a contemporary <laughs> expression. But uh, I'm paraphrasing Wesley there at that point. The fifth characteristic of, a, of the spiritual leaders that will lead uh, a spiritual awakening is a visionary leader. Uh, Nehemiah not only saw the walls that were destroyed, but he saw the walls rebuilt. He, he had a vision. And uh, when, when the king said, what is it that you want? He had a ready answer. He, he was able to tell him the vision of what he wanted to accomplish. A, a, a person who God uses to be a, the leader of a spiritual awakening will also be a prepared leader. leader. When, when the king said to him, okay, this is what you want, he also said, what are you going to need? You know, sometimes we have wonderful dreams and plans, but we have no strategy for accomplishing it. But when the king said, what is it that you're going to need? Nehemiah had a list ready. He, al- he already told, he-, he was ready to tell him uh, what he needed. And the seventh thing is then that he is a, he was a, an equipped leader. Uh, in Nehemiah 2.9, uh, when Nehemiah left for Jerusalem. He had made preparations for the safety. He had, he had some soldiers go with him for protection. He had made preparations for the material and human resources that he would need. Uh, I have in, in my office a, a framed back cover of a preacher's magazine from 20 years ago. If you, you, the, the Church of the Nazarene used to publish the, the uh, preacher's magazine. And this is just the outside you know, magazine cover. And I, and I framed it because it, 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 it's been such a powerful reminder to me in, in my ministry. And it's a quote from J. Hudson Taylor, the great 
uh, missionary to China, he said, God's work done God's way will never lack God's supply. And so we'll be, when, when God is ready to give a spiritual awakening, we don't have to worry about the resources. God will provide the resources. The third thing that we want to notice then, you know, first of all, we, we, we see the need and pray, and then God provides spiritual leaders. And I'm praying that somewhere on, on the campus of, of Houghton College or, or Kingswood or one of our other colleges or universities or some other campus that God is already putting it in their heart. Maybe somebody that's at Asbury Seminary or Wesley uh, Seminary, that, that, that God is planting it in their heart that they're going to be the leader of this spiritual awakening. Or maybe it's a young pastor in, in a church, but we, we, God is going to give us that kind of, of a leader. And then he gives the leader a clear message. He gives the leader a clear, clear message. When, when the leader speaks, nobody has to guess what he's talking about. He has a clear message from God to share with the people. Billy Graham, as an example, the best known phrase from Billy Graham's lengthy ministry has been, the Bible says... The Bible says he's clear about the preaching. And so the first thing that we, we notice as, as the clear message, that, that we are to preach the word. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, or yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it says, preach the, the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Preach the word. Frenchman his, historian Alexis de Croqueville arrived in America in 1831 to decipher the secrets of the young nation's success. And, and he said, I, I went around and, and, and I, I went into the public schools. I went out and I saw the great natural resources, the, the grain and, and, and the, the fertile soil and, and the uh, great industries. I went and I saw the government and the leaders and the Constitution. And he said, it was not until I came into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. I don't know about the rest of you preachers, but that's convicting to me. He looked at America as a young nation and he said, it's great and I found the secret of its greatness in the powerful pulpits of its churches. And if we look at our culture today and say we are in a great need of a spiritual awakening, then it, causes, it calls us as preachers to be bold and courageous in preaching the Word of God, whether it's popular or not. And then the other thing is that the message is to be a message of transformation, Preach for transformation. The second half of that verse in, in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 2 says, Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. And, and he, so he provides this clear message. It's, it's a, clear, a clear message of salvation. Franklin Graham recently wrote, We cannot sincerely proclaim the truth of God's love while ignoring what he hates. And God hates sin. His love pours out the remedy for sin that holds mankind in bondage. It is in his unmerited grace, the gift of salvation. We are living in a world today who says that we don't love them because we teach, teach the truth about sin. The reality is the evidence that we do love them is because we preach the truth about sin. We're not willing to let them go on in their sin and pay the penalty of their sin, but we proclaim the truth of salvation. And it's not only a, a clear message of salvation, it's a clear message of transformation. Tony Calci observed, revivals usually occur after a prolonged spiritual and moral decline. By definition, a revival requires a state of death, neglect, or loss. This has always been true historically. The church becomes apathetic to its master, its morals, and its mission. It loses its zeal and becomes ineffective. Its worship becomes dull and uneventful, and its membership declines. It needs to be revived occasionally for its own sake, a message of transformation. And God's word pokes and provokes the dead or dying church to wake up. 
In Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, I'm going to read this. It says, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthening what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Nobody, nobody likes to be poked and provoked to wake up. I remember when I was a child. I I loved my, my mother. My mother died when she was 57 years old, back in 1988, she had three different kinds of cancer in two years, and and she passed away. But when I was a kid, I remember being sound asleep, and it was time, you know, get up and get ready to go to school, and uh, I just wasn't ready to do that. You know, you don't have any kids like that, do you? Uh, or, Or any grandchildren, you don't know anybody that was like that? Well, my mother, bless her heart, she could not sing in tune. And, and she would come in. That, I, I blame that for why I can't sing. In tune. But anyway, she would come in early in the morning, sometimes in the wintertime, you know, it was still dark and all that. And she would come in with this cheery, off tune voice and sing, Good morning to you, good morning to you. We're all in our places with bright, shining faces. I thought, Oh, Lord, help me. You know, this is the way I w- woke up in the morning. I love my mother, but I didn't love that part of, of growing up. And nobody likes to be poked and provoked, but it is a necessary part of spiritual awakening. It's a necessary part of personal and church revival. Somebody has to point out, hey, we're dead. We need to wake up. We need, we, we're not living in 1950 anymore. The, the, the world needs the church to be alive and relevant and reaching out and doing something today. And so God, we pray for spiritual awakening and revival. God chooses a spiritual leader or a group of spiritual leaders, and he gives a clear message of salvation and transformation. And in that preaching and in that clear message, there is also sound doctrine. God calls the leaders of revival and spiritual awakening to proclaim the truth, whether it's popular or not. We live in a time when preaching the truth is unpopular. It's not even popular with Christians, let alone popular in the world. But he he calls us to preach sound doctrine. Billy Graham said, how could the early disciples turn the world upside down when millions of Christians can't even keep it right side up today? The answer is simple. They didn't conform their faith to the world. They had the truth and they refused to water it down. They held a faith that would not compromise. Prayer, God responds by giving us spiritual leaders, and he gives those spiritual leaders a a clear message of salvation and transformation. Up to this time, a lot of heads nodding. Amen. Preach it, preacher. Now we're going to get in the last half of the message, and we're going to go into troubled water. So hang on to your seat. When that message begins to take hold and People who were lost are saved. And when a new generation has a new experience with God, salvation and transformation, it's only natural that as a result of this new experience that that comes out of of the message of salvation and transformation, that people who are gifted in that way will write new songs. You see, there's a new experience. There's a new movement. God is doing a new thing. And people will set that experience that they have into new songs. And the greatest movement of God in human history was begun by the birth of Jesus Christ. For 400 years, there was no word from God. There's no evidence of any dreams or visions or anything from the word of God. There was, another, there was not another book of the Bible that was written for 400 years until an angel appeared to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. And then an angel came to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and, and told her that she was going to bring forth the son of God. And she went to visit Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, and she burst out in song in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 46. She burst out in song. A a new movement of God was begun, and she sang. And, And songs were written and sung in the Bible when God did a new thing in their lives. The Israelites sang after the crossing the Red Sea. The Israelites sang again at a well in the desert. Deborah sang after deliverance from the Canaanite king. 
The women sang after David killed Goliath. You remember Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his tens of thousands. They were singing and dancing in the streets. The Psalms mention new songs six times. The Bible tells us that Solomon wrote over a thousand new songs in his lifetime. James said that our singing should be a reflection of our happiness. And how, really hold on to your seats. The book of Revelation tells us that even in heaven, the great gathering sings a new song to the Lamb. And don't read too much of the book of Revelation or you may not want to go to heaven because it tells us it's not only a new song, but it's loud. It's loud. Woo. I know some saints that wouldn't want to be there. Not only do we have this evidence in Scripture, but songs were written and sung in church history as part of revivals. And I want, I want you to follow this progression with me. I will not be able to present this without a smile and maybe a chuckle, okay? Because it's just, it, it is so real to us today. But in, in um, the Church of England at the time of the Wesleys, all that they did was to chant psalms lifelessly. And both Charles and John felt that this was a great deficiency. And so they began to sing lively songs, and Charles Wesley began to write songs and sing them, not in the Church of England, but out in the fields. And then around the same time, Isaac Watts published his classic collection of hymns and spiritual songs. And while those new songs were being written and sung throughout England, many American churches and ministers opposed them. We, we didn't want those new songs, you know, those, those lively songs that, uh, you know, it's just not like the psalms we always chant it, and so we didn't like it. And, uh, and so George Whitfield came to the United States, and he joined up with Jonathan Edwards, and uh, he began to promote this, the, the hymns of Watts because they were better suited to the metric, better suited than the metrical Psalms to his fervent style of preaching, okay? So they chanted Psalms in the Church of England. John and Charles thought that was a deficiency. Charles began to write new ones. Isaac Watts uh, 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 um, wrote new ones. Those were rejected in America. Whitfield came, and he was a lively preacher, so they sang these lively songs of Isaac Watts. Well, then in the time of Charles Finney in the next century, an important part, an aspect of the revival meetings that Finney had was his use of music. And uh, the camp meeting movement at the time had, had uh, taken uh, singing as a vital part, and they sang and, and rejoice, but the Presbyterian and the Congregational churches were slow to abandon the old Psalms, and listen to this, the stolid hymns of Isaac Watts. I mean, the generation before, they were too lively for them. By the time Finney comes in on the scene, the author says they were the stolid hymns of, of Watts. I mean, they were too slow and draggy, and so Finney did his best to promote good choir singing and introduced more modern music in his great revival uh, movement. And uh, he brought with him Charles Hastings, and, and Hastings taught and wrote music, uh, directed Finney's choir, and composed the melody for Rock of Ages. Hastings set a precedent for future choristers and musical co-evangelists. The, the, the 20th century revivals that we love were impacted from the, the revivalism of, of Finney. And then Dwight L. Moody came at the last, late, latter part of that 18th century, excuse me, 19th century. Uh, he traveled around with his, traveling, uh, his singing evangelist, Iris Sankey, and uh, as a result, had significant results that uh, followed Moody and Sankey wherever they went. And Sankey not only led music, but he composed music for such hymns as Faith is the Victory, Trusting Jesus Under His Wings, and 90 and 9. Are, are you beginning to see a pattern here? God calls a leader in response to the prayers of the people 
He gives them a strong, clear message. People's lives are transformed, and music, new music, is used to reach the people. And then in the Billy Graham years, Cliff Barrow said that the Christian faith is a singing faith and a good way to express it and share it with others in community singing. And during the lengthy ministry of Billy Graham, much of his success was impacted by music from George Beverly Shea in 1947 to Michael W. Smith in the 1990s to DC Talk uh, in the previous decade from, from where we're at now, and more recently, the Newsboys and Lecrae in this decade. A song that we sing, We Believe, was launched by Billy Graham Evangelistic Association for um, DC, or excuse me, for the newsboys. New songs should be embraced today as we seek revival. If when God did a new thing in the Bible, they sang new songs. And if we can trace through church history that when revival came, they sang new songs, and I think we can all agree we need revival in America. We need spiritual awakening in America. And so if we're going to pray for God to send spiritual awakening in America, then as the church of Jesus Christ, we need to embrace new songs. Because if we, if we know what has happened through all the ages to this day, and that that was always part of revival, why would we expect God to send a revival and, and go the opposite direction. You know, I've had some people say, share to me, we're not going to have revival in America until we get back to singing the old hymns. The Bible and church history tells us exactly the opposite of that. I don't mean that to be mean-spirited, but it is the truth. We, we need to embrace new music today. A number of the songs that we sang over the last six or seven weeks here at Calvary during this sermon series are songs like Thrive by Casting Crown, Revival by Robin Mark, Burning in My Soul by Matt Mayer, Build Your Kingdom Here by Ren Collective, Revive Us Again, The Contemporary Arrangement, God's Not Dead video by The Newsboys, Start a Fire by Unspoken, Consuming Fire by Hillsong United and Tim Hughes, Good to Be Alive by Jason Gray. The reality is over and over and over again, there, the new music is crying out and calling for revival and for spiritual awakening. I wore this T-shirt just for you this morning. It's Build Your Kingdom Here. I told you last night I love that song by Ren Collective. Uh, uh, about a month or so ago, my wife and I went over to Lancaster County, to New Holland, Pennsylvania, to hear Ren Collective. I heard them on the radio. I heard this song. I love this song. And I, didn't, I, I really didn't know if I would like them live, but we went, and we pulled in, and we saw all these teenagers going into the church. Uh, I don't know exactly how many uh, people that sanctuary held, but it was at least 1,000, maybe 1,200, I don't know. 80% of the people in the room were under 20. Most of the other adults in the room were probably there because they were their sponsors and their youth workers. Now, my wife and I were not the oldest people in the room, but we were getting pretty close. There was a, okay? And so, like 80%, 80, 80%, 800 or more teenagers are there. And they moved to the front, all down around the front and up the aisle, and Ren Collective, partway through the concert, they began to sing, build your kingdom here. And they began to sing about revival. And those young people had their hands in the air, and they were jumping up and down, and they were thrilled. And I was moved, and I got excited. I've been in some of those kind of places before, and if I really get excited, I kind of do this. You know, I just kind of get my, <laughs> my feet never leave the ground, but I get up there. But I was so excited I actually got in the air. And I can just hear John Croft right now. He's thinking, yeah, that fat old man, it was probably, you could probably get, you could probably barely get a thread under there. John, I got so far off the ground, you could have gotten a piece of knitting underneath there. I mean, it was, I, mean I was off the ground at least this much. But I was, oh, my, my heart longs for, and this is becoming the passion of my ministry, 
that I would love to see the day that our churches, all across the front of our churches and back the aisles, there would be young people who are praising God and hungry for God, not because we invite them to or ask them to or tell them they should, but because they have experienced a new experience with God and they are responding to what God is doing. I, I may be 10 or 12 or 13 years away from the end of my ministry. I've, uh, this past summer, we celebrated our 40th anniversary in ministry. And if there's one thing I long for, and one thing that I want to see accomplished before my ministry ends, and before I die, is to see a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God among our young people and changes our churches and changes our nation, it may be the only hope that this world has. Then the fifth thing is, don't unbuckle your seatbelt yet. We still have some difficult terrain to go yet. The fifth thing is new methods for a new movement. Jesus told the disciples of John the Baptist in Matthew 9, 14 to 17, that you don't put new wine into old wineskins. And it was when they were asking, how comes your disciples don't do what we and the Pharisees do? And Jesus said, what I'm about to do is too big for your wineskin. It, it would burst. You, you need new wineskins. You need, you need new fresh leather, leather pouches. The, the old, dry, stiff, cracked vessels are not good enough. If, if I do what I'm going to do in your methods, it'll blow them to pieces. New methods will come as a result of revival. And there's some things that, uh, uh, some characteristics of, of re revival movements. A revival is a movement of God. It's not us. It's, a, you know, a, a, a revival isn't going to come because you came to this conference or because of those of us who have preached. It's a movement of God. We, can, we, we want to, to be tools in God's hands, but it's a movement of God. And innovative evangelistic methods are burst in the, in the, or birthed in the midst of, of a spiritual movement led by the Holy Spirit, and young people are, play a prominent role in such a revival. Someone has said, an awakening entails young people reinventing traditional rituals, making the faith of their forefathers their own. This isn't just an observation on the MTV age. It's been the final stage of every awakening before a national transformation is complete, to hit critical mass, it takes a youth movement. I was born in 1955. I'm, I'll be 59 in just a few weeks. I was born in a nation that knew it was a Christian nation. It wasn't long before that, that in God we trust was beginning to be stamped on our currency. And now we are turning over to another generation, a nation that we know is not a Christian nation. And I'm not, I'm waving my finger, but I'm not pointing at anybody. For 40 of those years, I was in the pulpit. But whatever it is, for good or bad, whatever we did in the church, whether we liked it or not, or, you know, we might have wonderful memories of all the wonderful things that God did, but the fact of the matter is that what we did in the church for those 50-some years did not have the desired impact on our culture. While we were in the church doing all of our church stuff, our world is going to hell. And so why would we tell another generation well, you have to do it the way we did it. It didn't work for us. Why would it work for them? Some people say, oh, I'm fearful for the future. A, 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 another generation, oh my, these young people are just not like us. Praise God. Maybe they'll be effective. <laughs> and when I walk on campuses, in the last 10 days, I've been on the campus of, of, of Kingswood and Houghton. And when I see those young people studying and learning in a Christian environment, and, and, and they're, they're calling out and praying and seeking revival, it does my heart good. This is exactly what we've been praying for, church, when we are praying for revival 
and a spiritual awakening. And then some examples, John Wesley preaching in the fields. He didn't want to do that. George Whitfield didn't want to do that. John Wesley at one point said, it makes my skin crawl to think of preaching out in the open air. But he did it anyway because it was effective in reaching people for Christ. Charles Finney developed what became known as New Measures. Billy Graham, in his years of ministry, was a pioneer in mass evangelism using motion pictures, sports arenas and stadiums, TV and video, satellite technology, and cyberspace. All of those first time in history of of that kind of a movement, and, and he was innovative in his methods. J. Lee Grady gives us these applications for the church today as we seek a revival movement. We must break free from the fear of change. We are, as the church of Jesus Christ, are often afraid of change. We have to break free from the fear of change. The second thing is that we must be willing to to defy tradition. If six or seven years ago, I came here six years ago, let's say seven or eight years ago, if you'd have told me that I'd have had the privilege of pastoring this church and that we were going to have a conference like this and that I would be preaching in a T-shirt and jeans with a jacket on, I'd have told you you were crazy. Dr. Carl became our district superintendent and about six or seven months before that, he was here and preached for us. And after the service, we went out for lunch together and He's, I was talking about the vision and the things that we wanted to accomplish. He said, Dwight, do you really want to reach our culture? Do you really want to reach un, unsaved people? I said, absolutely. He said, lose that shirt and t- or that jacket and tie, that suit and tie. Now, he wasn't saying if you wear jeans and you convince everybody else to wear jeans, we're going to have revival. But what he was saying is you have to be willing to get out of it you've been doing this for 40 years. You have to break the mold. You have to be willing to make people comfortable when they come into your building. You have to be able to communicate with them and and make it easy for them to come to church because not everybody on the street has a suit and tie. Not everybody in the street feels comfortable to come in in a street and tie. And so sometimes on Sunday mornings, I preach like this. I've been, I I have been offered more free ties in the past couple years. (laughs) And I tell people, no, I have a hundred or more of them things hanging in my closet, and I'm saving them for weddings and funerals. And <laughs> when I wore ties, nobody wanted to give me any, and I had to go buy them. But we need to be willing to defy tradition. I have lived by the book for almost 40 years, and the world is going to hell. And so I have to be willing to defy tradition. Even though I love the church, I love the traditions of the church, and I would be the last one to to want to change the church, if I really am serious about a revival and spiritual awakening, then I have to be willing to defy what I love for the cause of Christ and for a new movement of spiritual awakening. And J. J. Lee Grady says we must ask the Spirit to reveal his strategies. And then the last point, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because that's what the whole conference is about, and that's missional holiness. But A.W. Tozer, a great 20th century pastor and writer, said, prayer is never an acceptable substitute for obedience. The sovereign Lord accepts no offering from his creatures that is not accompanied by obedience. To pray for revival while ignoring or actually flouting the plain precept laid down in the scriptures is to waste a lot of words and get nothing for our trouble. The apostle Paul writes to Titus and tells him the power of God's transforming grace. And this was the heart of the message that I preached last year, and I'm not going to go into it very far. But again, the message that is given, the clear message, is a message of salvation. And in Titus chapter 2, verse 11, we see that, that the apostle Paul tells Titus, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And all throughout church history, with John Wesley, with Phoebe Palmer, with, with the, the Welsh revival, and, um, and then on through Moody and Sunday and, and Mordecai Ham and Billy Graham, all of these had at its core 
salvation. Many, many people coming to know Jesus Christ. The, 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 the uh, uh, results of revival. And so our moving out beyond these walls begins with the message of salvation. When we talk about missional, sometimes people think only of compassion and justice and those kinds of things. But we are not doing anyone any eternal good if all we do is feed them and defend them from injustice. That needs to be done, but the message of salvation must go along with it because we don't only want to make their lives better in this world. We want to see them be able to go to heaven through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. But not only salvation, but transformation. A.W. Tozer also wrote, salvation apart from obedience is unknown in the sacred scriptures. As we think of the church of Jesus Christ today, why, oh why, have we gone from being a Christian nation to being a, a nation that clearly is not Christian? And I believe that it's the lack of transformed lives in, the, in people who claim salvation, that lack of transformation is at the heart of the failure of the church to be effective in positive impact in our culture. I remember the vice chairman of our board one Sunday morning, and this was when I was in Bridgeton, New Jersey. Somebody from his workplace came to church, and he said to me, oh, I didn't know so-and-so went to church. He didn't say, I didn't know he came to church here. He didn't even know he went to church. He was the vice chairman of our board. This man didn't see Christ revealed at work. You see, we, 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 we call people to salvation. We, we invite them to pray, but are we really living transformed lives out in the world where people live? And I would say over the last 50 years, and this is, this is just me, this isn't research, this is just my heart. I believe one of the reasons that we have not been effective in transforming society is because we have not lived transformed lives. We have a lot of people who make professions of faith, but they keep on living the way they always lived. And unless we are going to show them the power of God for transformation, they are not going to believe us. You see, Wesley offers an optimistic view of grace. For Wesley, sanctification is an inseparable complement to justification, namely our present deliverance by God from the plague of sin, not just from its penalty. Let, let's, let's look at the, this transformation. What does this transformation look like? And, and, and we're going to follow verses 12 to 14. Paul, Paul tells Titus, he says, it it, this grace that brings salvation, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. People want to say I'm saved, but live the way they've always lived. Can we say no? Say it together. No. Yeah. God, the grace of God teaches us that. It doesn't just save us from past sins. It doesn't just forgive our sins. But Paul says this grace that brings salvation teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. This grace teaches us to, to live self-controlled, upright, upright, and godly lives. In, in the culture today, and in, in the church culture, there are many Christians that don't even want to be considered godly or holy or righteous. Man, that, those are negative terms, even to Christians many times. Paul says that the grace of God teaches us to live godly lives. And our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. The second question that comes then is when does this transformation take place? Okay. You know, some people teach, you know, you get saved, then you sin the rest of your life, and somehow when you die and get rid of the body, then all of a sudden you're going to be holy so you can go to heaven. That is not what we believe. It's not what the Scripture teaches, and it is not Wesleyan theology. Paul says that this transformation takes place in this present age, in the church age, while we are living in this world, 
our lives are transformed. If we have a testimony that God has saved us through the blood of Jesus Christ, then our lives are transformed. That grace that saves us teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to live godly lives. And and this is also taking place while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then the third thing under missional holiness is the mission. Titus 2.14 says, these who have now been purified by the grace of God, purified to be God's people, he says, are eager to do what is good. And I'm running out of time, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that. That's what the whole conference is about. I could give you examples from church history, but I'm going to skip over that this morning. Uh, And I trust that in the seminars and in your interactions, this whole idea of the mission of God, not just doing what we want, but doing what God wants. I remember back in 1972, I was 16 years old. I had just started dating my wife about two months before that. Six months earlier than that, I injured my back playing backyard football, and then the next day started wrestling practice, and I just really tore up my back. I've suffered with it all the rest of my life. I've had back surgeries and all that. But in those days, when they put you in the hospital, they put you in traction, put a belt around your waist and hooked up uh, ropes and put it over a pulley and had weights on it. I was in the hospital bed for 13 days straight, 16 days in the hospital, 13 of my feet never touched the floor. And Jane's pastor came. They had had a great movement of God in their church, especially among the young people. And he brought in new music, songs I had never heard before, songs like He Touched Me, The King is Coming, Because He Lived, 1972. He Touched Me was eight years old. The King is Coming was two years old. Because He Lives was one year old. I remember laying in that hospital bed. I should have been out on the ball field listening to that music and the tears running down the sides of my face toward my ears because I was laying flat on my back. And in those days, God called me to the ministry. And I said yes. And I've been living on that call for over 40 years now. And I want to say to you this morning, we need to have a spiritual awakening in our lives and in our church and a spiritual awakening in our world. And if it happens, it will most likely happen among our young people. And you might say, well, pastor, despite all the stuff that you've said, I still don't like the new music. And I still don't like the new methods. What about me? I've been in the church for years. I've paid my tithes. I've used my talents. I've been faithful to God. I want to say this morning, thank you. Thank you. We wouldn't have what we have if it wouldn't be for you. But if you're really praying for revival, and you really believe that the only hope for America is a spiritual awakening, I want you to think back when you were younger. Think of the face of some person in your church. May have been here, may have been somewhere else. But as a young person, you said, that person's a saint. He or she is a prayer warrior. They might have come alongside of you and encouraged you as a young person. And though they're gone, just the picture of their face in your mind or the mention of their name brings warm feelings. And I say to us, in this time of rapid change, it used to take 100 years to bring change. It doesn't hardly take 100 hours for change anymore. And in the time of rapid change, if we really want revival, us who are older, I'm including me, I'm one of the old fat ones that John talked about the other day. 
we who are old, <laughs> first time he said uh, amen in the whole message. Um, <laughs> but we who are older, we need to put our arms around the young people. We need to tell them we're praying for them. We need to tell them we love them. They might wear a baseball cap into church. They might come in and do things that we think are disrespectful to the building. You may never get them in a necktie, but we need to let them know that we love them, that we're praying for them. And we need to not only tell them that, we need to really be doing it because I believe, and Mick mentioned it in one of his messages, I believe the time is coming when we talk about Christian persecution, it's not gonna be across the sea. It's not going to be in another part of the world. There's going to be times coming, maybe even in our lifetimes, where putting a gun to somebody's head or a knife to the throat and saying, you deny Christ or you die, it could happen any time. And if there's ever a spiritual awakening in America, someone is going to pay the price. And it'll probably be our young people. It'll probably be the young leader that God is calling. And so let's sincerely pray for it. Let's encourage them. And I'm not talking about being put on the shelf. I'm only talking about in regard to revival. If you still have the health and strength to, to work in the church, I'm not saying that you should stop all of that. What I'm saying is rather than resisting change and resisting new music and resisting new methods, we need to be the people that encourage the young people because they need it and praying for them. There was a man by the name of Gypsy Smith, who was very effective evangelist with um, William Booth. And this is where you're going to need your note-taking guide, the front cover. He was, he was actually raised by the gypsies. He taught himself how to read, but he became an effective evangelist. And somebody asked him, how does revival begin? And he said, take a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself, and then pray these words, Lord, send revival and begin it right here in this circle. And so this morning, as we close later than I should, I set the time schedule so I can ignore it. Uh, Lord God, send a revival and begin it right here in this circle. And then there's another prayer that I want us to pray. It's based on Psalm 190, or 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. The prayer says... Search me, O God, and know my heart. Show me any wicked way that needs to be corrected in my own life before revival can come. I'm praying for revival. Help me to also be obeying. Amen. What I would like for us to do, as you leave this morning, we have a piece of sidewalk chalk for everyone. It's a beautiful day. It's supposed to get up around 70 later today. I would like for us to go out on the parking lot. There's probably not too much traffic in and out, but remember it is a parking lot, so watch out for cars. But on a parking lot or on the sidewalks, anywhere around the property here, I'd like to, for you in the next 25 minutes before the seminars begin to go out and draw a circle around yourself and pray the first prayer, Lord, send revival and begin it right here in this circle. And then I want you to pray the second prayer as you leave the circle. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Show me any wicked way that needs to be corrected in my own life before revival can come. I'm praying for revival. Help me also to be obeying. And then step out of the circle with a new and fresh determination to obey God in whatever ways he shows you. We're not all called to do the same thing. But whatever God has gifted you to do and called you to do, be willing to say, I'll do it for the sake of revival. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these wonderful people. 
who have sat here and, and listened to me to talk for over an hour, six sermons. I thank you for their graciousness. But Lord, I pray that you would give us revival in the church and a spiritual awakening in our nation that will spread to the nations. Help us to repent of our sin. Help us to to repent of saying, I love God and then disobeying God. Help us to repent of loving what we're doing inside the church no matter what happens to people outside the church. Lord, forgive us for all the things that you want to show us in our lives. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart and see if there's anything in me, in me that would keep revival from coming in the church and a spiritual awakening from coming in the culture. Lord, I pray that each of us would pray this prayer and that when we leave this conference, that we would take all that we've heard in the messages and in the seminars and in our interaction with one another, and may we take it home and may we apply it in our lives. And, oh, God, send revival. Oh, God, give us a spiritual awakening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.